And if tomorrow we decided we had the lithium abundance wrong, they would go back and, and change the model. One of those parameters are like eight or ten free parameters. Okay. That's another one to get the model to fix. So I'm not impressed with those kind of predictions. They're, they're actually not predictions no. at all. They keep, they keep adding additional factors in. So and, it almost and, makes it uh, non-falsifiable. In other words, there's well, nothing there that can falsify that's it because they keep changing yeah. it. It's like and jello. It's like jello. As soon as, as soon as a new problem comes along, new observation. This happened many, many times. You simply hypothesize, hypothesize a new field, a new force, a new factor, and that saves your bacon each time. It's becoming a rescuing device. But I think with writings on the wall... Evidently, 40% of Americans disagree with you, and they can't reconcile their faith with the theory of evolution. The figure varies between 40-45% and has done for about the last 30 years. It's an astonishing figure, and it's, that appears to be true. Gallup polls seem to suggest that that is true. It's even worse than that, because they actually believe that the world is less than 10,000 years old. And c because since the true age of the Earth is 4.6 billion years old, that's a non-trivial error. I've previously compared it... <laughs> I've previously compared it to believing that the width of North America is eight yards. <laughs> Let's face it, there was a bishop in the middle ages there, uh, 1800 something, uh, who added up the dates listed uh, in Genesis and he came up with the world that had been around for 6,000 years. There ain't no way that's possible. You know, anybody that's in the oil business knows that he's drilling down, he drilled down 2,000 uh, excuse me, two miles, three miles, four miles underground. You're coming into all these layers that were laid down by the dinosaurs. And we have skeletons of dinosaurs that go back about uh, 1.65 million years. And to say that it all came about in 6,000 years is just nonsense. And I think the time we, we come off of that stuff and say this isn't possible. And, <clears throat> but I mean, so there was a big bang, so. <clears throat> that uh, some other effect could mimic the signal. If it's real, I doubt if it's real, but if it's real, it could be mimicked by something else. And, and I was uh, lambasted by people. One of them was um, a website called The Friendly Atheist. I don't know if you've tangled with him yet, but uh, he was uh, just just saying what, a, what an idiot or fool I was to suggest such a thing. You know, Basically, this is we've proved cosmic inflation, Big Bang models proved, you people believe in six-day creation, you're totally wrong, blah, blah, blah. Even a couple of uh, Christian folk uh, took me on <laughs> saying, because they, they believe in the Big Bang and cosmic inflation, and kind of kind of ridiculed me.
North Pole. There's just a big ring of ice out there, and how far that ring goes, nobody knows, supposedly. So since there is no South Pole, no one's been there. Well, I've known people who have spent uh, you know, six months at the South Pole station we have, research station. I guess they've lied about it all, I suppose. <laughs> they, yeah, that's, cause, that's because they're part of the Illuminati. <laughs> part of the conspiracy, yep. And, and of course, the, you have to believe that there are, in this model, it's domed over with the, uh, this dome with the stars and sun and moon on it. So uh, you can't have any space travel. So NASA has lied about everything it's done. We've never landed on the moon, never mind the fact that there are at least two Christians who walked on the moon and there are numerous Christian astronauts who've orbited the Earth. That's They're right. all lying, too. That's right. And of course, as a PhD astronomer, I'm in a position to know better, and so I must be lying as well. But, you know, no one's made that claim about me yet. I suspect that's coming. Uh, but no one's at least come to me and said, yeah, you're part of the conspiracy, too, and you're lying as well. Uh, the sheer volume of the amount of liars involved has to be uh, incredible. Ernst Haeckel, the German professor from Jena University, made up this entire dumb idea in 1869. Darwin's book came out in 1859. The next year it was translated to German. Haeckel read the book and said, wow, what a great theory. If only we had some evidence. Nine years later, they still had no evidence, so Haeckel decided to make some. He was an embryology professor. He's taught how embryos develop, so he took a drawing of a dog and a human embryo and changed them, made them look just alike and said, see, this proves we have a common ancestor with dogs. Well, nobody ca caught on or stopped him, so he did a bunch more. He took drawings of all kinds of different animals and faked them, and he made them all look very, very similar. Haeckel made giant posters of his fake drawings and traveled all over Germany and told everybody, you ought to believe this new theory because we've got the proof right here. On top are Haeckel's fake drawings. Underneath are actual photographs of what he claimed he was drawing a picture of. Haeckel lied deliberately. His own university held a trial and convicted him in 1875. He said, I should feel utterly condemned, except uh, hundreds of biologists lie under the same charge. Everybody else lies, so it's okay for me to lie too. Haeckel's biogenetic law is as dead as a doornail, folks. It's not true. It never was true. Proven wrong, 1875. It's not true. He was convicted of fraud. His own university held a trial and convicted one of their own professors of lying. But his drawings are still used in textbooks in your county tonight. Proven wrong 125 years ago. scientists line up overwhelmingly on one side of this issue. It would have to be an enormous conspiracy going on between scientists of all different disciplines in all different countries to have such a consensus. Does That doesn't move you? No, not at all, because from a biblical perspective, I understand why the majority would not agree with the truth. Man is a sinner. Man is in rebellion against his creator. All these scientists are sinners? Well... Uh -huh. Suppose somebody's coming through town and they're handcuffing everybody, taking them off to jail, and then they're going to kill them. But you don't have any arms.
If you want to get the correct answer, you better start with the truth of God's word. Evolutionists commit errors in reasoning, fallacies, left and right, and we let them get away with it, and we really shouldn't. For their own benefit, we need to politely point, point out that these are fallacious, the arguments they're using. So let's start with the glory of God being revealed in the heavens. That's something that the Bible uh, teaches us. In Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And uh, there are a number of ways in which the universe displays God's glory. And it really reveals his character. It's quite wonderful. Yeah, I want to concentrate just on two because I can't hit all of them, obviously. But I'm going to show you that the size and the beauty of the universe are certainly consistent with the mind of God and not just sort of a chance explosion or rapid expansion or what have you. Psalm 19, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And astronomy is one of those fields that has been um, used to challenge the Bible. You've heard people say probably that, well, the Bible can't be true because of what we learned about, you know, the Big Bang and astronomy and things like that. But uh, I want to show you that really, when you understand the cosmos, it confirms what the Bible teaches. There are secrets to be revealed in the cosmos that confirm biblical creation. I'm going to cover five of these uh, this evening.
Earth is suspended in space. Job chapter 26, verse 7 says that God hangs the earth upon nothing. A wonderful poetic description of the nature of gravity. How about that? Might have been hard to believe when it was written. After all, you know, most things don't hang on nothing. And that's not what the experts of the day taught. They taught that the earth was a flat disk and floated in water. And wouldn't that make more sense? Because after all, things float in water. We've seen that. But you can't hang something upon nothing. Well, you can't, but God can, and he did. And again, the uh, description, which is perfectly accurate, God got it right long before the secular experts of the day figured that out. Pretty interesting. I like to think of the Bible like prescription lenses that are designed just for you. You put them on, the world snaps into focus, you see things as they are. I think of evolution like red glasses. You put on red glasses, you see red everywhere. It's not that the world is red, but your view has been colored by the glasses you're wearing. But my point here is that we all have these worldviews which consist of presuppositions. And so that's just uh, technical jargon for your most basic convictions about reality. What you hold to be true very dearly. You, there are things you already believe before you come to, to, to the evidence. So do you get the point? Have we learned the lesson of history? Have we learned that in the past, whenever experts of the day have disagreed with the Bible, the Bible has always turned out to be right? And wouldn't it have to be if it really is the Word of God? What about today? Have we learned that lesson of history? Not everyone's learned that lesson of history because you'll have people today that say, well, we know the Bible got it wrong here. And they're just setting themselves up to have egg on their face the way the experts of the past did. When God speaks on something, he's right. He's God. Interesting. So yeah, there's a certain uh, number of people who are still promoting this idea, and uh, I would say that the scriptures that are used to promote it really haven't changed. They're always the same. Uh, you come back to the same things over and over again. When we speak of the immutability of God, we are referring to the fact that God's essential nature never changes. I would say that the scriptures that are used to promote it really haven't changed. They're always the same. Right. And in many of your articles, you bring up the idea that um, the Bible uses equivocal language in certain areas where it touches on uh, the shape of the earth, if you will. Uh, what did you right. mean by that? illustration to explain what I mean. Um, we have, I've come across critics who say that um, if Jesus really wanted to impress people and impress us, he should have spoken about redwood trees. 
And then in the future, we in the future would have, uh, you know, seen that and gone, oh, wow, that's amazing proof, uh, you know, that God is real. But, you know, what these people don't realize is that if Jesus starts talking about redwood trees to these people, well, nobody's going to understand a word he's going to say, uh, and they're going to think he's crazy. And it, to us, it's a given. Redwood trees are for real. But if, if an ancient person or Jesus talked about redwood trees, they would think he's out of his mind. In the same way, if Jesus had been teaching people that the earth was spherical, uh, rather than as whatever they believed at the time, mostly flat earth, then no one would have listened to him. They would have considered him insane. So you have a, a sort of a balance here between the power of the message and the truth of the message. How do you strike that balance? And my idea was that uh, God accommodated human finitude. He just he put in things that could be interpreted either way, that were not definitive language as to far as what the uh, Bible was actually teaching. <laughs> and that was the view, as I uh, taught it originally, for the, for the uh, Cre- uh, excuse me, Answers in Genesis article. And I developed that a bit further for the Christian Research Journal more than a decade later, and it explained, explained it much the same way that the difficulty was that God was dealing with people who had no concepts or no holding place for certain concepts, like a, like a spherical earth. And so the best way to keep from driving people away from the truth was, when it came to things like cosmology, keep your language simple and equivocal so that it could fix uh, any category of thought that someone might run into. Interesting. You know, what these people don't realize is that if Jesus starts talking about redwood trees to these people, well, nobody's going to understand a word he's going to say, uh, and they're going to think he's crazy. And uh, to us, it's a given. Redwood trees are for real. But if, if an ancient person or Jesus talked about redwood trees, they would think he's out of his mind. If you are saved, do you believe that he is your savior, the Messiah? Do you believe in the message of the gospel? Do you speak it? Do you believe he died on the cross and was buried in a cave? Three days later, he was raised. Now he is the king who sits in judgment over us. Do people say you're crazy? Or maybe people say you're evil? Do people say that you have a ridiculous story about Jesus? Is that what's happened to you? If it has, that's nothing new. Jesus, his family, thought there was something wrong with his mind. They tried to drag him out of a crowd. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him. For they were saying, he is out of his mind. Mark 3, 20 through 21. But if, if an ancient person or Jesus talked about redwood trees, they would think he's out of his mind. So you're not claiming that the Bible has scientific errors. You're just saying that they spoke in language and used words um, that could go in two different directions. Maybe sphere, maybe circle. But... It was spoken in such a way that, you know, hey, it it could really go either way. The Christian is not to compromise 
so as to obscure the distinction between good and evil, and is to avoid the errors of those dreamers, who have a spirit of bitterness and contradiction, who reprove everything, and pervert the order of nature. We will see some who are so deranged, not only in religion, but who in all things reveal their monstrous nature, that they will say that the sun does not move, and that it is the earth which shifts and turns. When we see such minds we must indeed confess, that the devil possesses them, and that God sets them before us as mirrors, in order to keep us, in his fear. So it is with all who argue out of pure malice, and who happily make a show of their imprudence. When they are old, that is hot, they will reply, no, it is plainly cold. When they are shown an object that is black, they will say that it is white, or vice versa. Just like the man who said that snow is black, for although it is perceived and known by all to be white, yet he clearly wished to contradict the fact. And so it is that they are madmen, who would try to change the natural order, and even to dazzle eyes, and benumb their senses. Exactly, and I think that's really you know, the only option you would have had. Um, this is one of the mistakes I, I spoke of regarding uh, Kyle Greenwood's book that I just wrote a review for. Um, he, he seems to believe that, for example, when Daniel was facing the king of Babylon, who was telling him about his dream and of a flat earth, that Daniel should have said, hey, hold on there, buddy, you know, the earth isn't flat, let me tell you the truth. Now, but what's, what's Nebuchadnezzar going to think of that? He's not going to respect that. He, 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 all his Chaldean wise men say exactly the opposite. And he might have had some respect for Daniel, but that would have started things going downhill. For Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon, he went and said thus unto him, Destroy not the wise men of Babylon, bring me in before the king, and I will shew unto the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus unto him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah, that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Art thou able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen, and the interpretation thereof? Daniel answered in the presence of the king, and said, The secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers, shew unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream, and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed, what should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. But as for me, the secret is not revealed to me for any wisdom that I have more than any living, but for their sakes that shall make known the interpretation to the king, and that thou mightest know the thoughts of thy heart. Now, but what's, what's Nebuchadnezzar going to think of that? He's not going to respect that. He, 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 all his Chaldean wise men say exactly the opposite. And he might have had some respect for Daniel, but that would have started things going downhill. 
and you know, there's there's no need uh, for God to go out of his way uh, just to please people in the 21st century who uh, you know, can't just be satisfied with what they got. I mean, we are we are not we are not at the belly button of history, and that's what people who say make that kind of argument are saying. They're saying that God should have accommodated us at the expense of ancient people. And no, sorry, they 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 were around a lot longer time than we were. So, and we can make the adjustments a lot easier than they can. We, who are faithful to Christ, should not be surprised that our relatives, our family members, think that we are crazy. Maybe they think that we are evil. We are judging them. Do you tend to feel discouraged? Don't. Jesus experienced this with people. They misunderstood him. He loved them anyway. It's the same with us today. We need to love those who think we are crazy. Why? Because we believe in Jesus.